We thank you that you not only call us to yourself, but you care for us. We thank you that as we gather today to hear your word, that your word will speak to us, challenging us, transforming us, and even planting seeds in us. We pray that our posture to your word will be one of faith, one of obedience, and one of readily being available to serve others. We pray, Lord, that we would diminish and that your purposes will increase in our lives. We pray that we will die to self and that we'll be alive in Christ. So guide me, Lord, as I open up the scriptures. Help me, O oh God, to submit to the authority of the scriptures, even in my communication. Help me to make Jesus more beautiful, more lovely. Help me to make Jesus the focus of our attention and invitation. And out of it all, may this church be encouraged, rebuked, directed to who you are and what you want this church to be. We pray your blessing upon us now as we hear from your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Greetings, my name is Batanai Manika, as you heard. And today I have a privilege of sharing with you from the word of God. Over the past few weeks, I've been walking through Philippians with a fine tooth comb. And for many, the walk through a Bible is not so much a walk of pausing on each word, but rather, have I read my 10 verses today? There's something about reading the Bible slowly that brings about nourishment to our souls. There's something about meditating on the word that brings about deep change in our hearts that realigns our affections and focuses us on what is important. So as we read the scriptures, my invitation to you and me in our own devotional times is that we take time to read the scriptures slowly. Perhaps you're familiar with the word and you can quote scripture and readily, easily. May I invite you not only to be the one who quotes scripture well, but the one who applies scripture appropriately. My walk through Philippians has opened up a few things in my own heart, challenging a few things in my own heart. But above all, my walk through Philippians has pointed me to Jesus in a focused way. And I would like to draw from my journey in Philippians as I hear the Spirit speak through the words of Paul to the church at Philippi and to us today. We live at a time where image is curated using very sharp tools. We live at a time where we use petri dishes of, or petri dishes of social media to culture images that are projected externally to make people think otherwise about us. We live in a culture where we are so good at creating platforms for popularity and influence. We live in a culture where it is very important to be seen the way you want to be seen and not so much in weakness or in pain. We live in a culture where celebrity is given to those who look good, feel good, and speak good. And we live in a culture that is averse to pain, averse to trouble. If there is trouble, show me the exit. If there is pain, show me the exit. And we have this type of Christian that is flimsy in the face of difficulty. A Christian who cannot endure when they are walking through the shadow or the valley of the shadow of death because they have not been strengthened by the word of God. We live in a culture that is lightweight Christianity. And when we read Philippians, we hear some heavyweight words, knockout words, Words that invite us to live in a gospel-informed way. And as we hear these words, we are invited 
to say, here I am, Lord, transform me. Now, before we look at the Bible, I would like to point out three men to us. One of them is called Martin Luther King Jr., famous for the civil rights, for his civil rights involvement, spearheading an entire culture of social reform in North America. His influence cascaded in other parts of the world, and some of his words are captured in his letters from a Birmingham jail. Umatiba, Uholisasa, Robin Island, in a confined space for so many years, comes out of prison, and out of that, he writes his long walk to freedom. Bonhoeffer, in a Nazi concentration camp because he refused to bow the knee to the then power of the Third Reich. Known for his cost or cost of discipleship. These men were men of great conviction and they had something in common. They were prepared to die for what they believed in. Friend, let me flip it this way and ask you this question. What are you prepared to die for? If it is not Jesus, if it is not the gospel, may I put it to us that somehow we are living in a way that is not consistent with gospel proclamation. Because I should be prepared to lay down my life. You should be prepared to lay down your life for Jesus in Jesus alone. Well, let me ask this question. What are you dying for? Are you dying for a big bank account? That promotion that is so, so good that you are aiming for? Are you dying for a life partner? And that's old, that's, you can't see anything else. It's like you're in a, D, a DNA headlight and you're like, oh, where is he? Where is she? If it's not Jesus, it doesn't produce life. Friends, when someone influential writes from prison, their words are important. Their words demand attention because these are not ordinary words. These are words that are born out of a crucible of pain. Words that are shaped by difficulty and words that are shaped by a deep conviction about a person's primary and central conviction. So Paul writes from the prison in Rome. And as he writes... He tells us a lot about what he's aspiring for. He tells us in somewhat ambiguous fashion whether he, well, he expects to come out of prison, yet at the same time, he doesn't know if he'll come out of prison. He tells us of his joy. He tells us of what he wants the Philippians to become like. He tells us of the different people in the church. But ultimately, the central cog of Paul's argument is the, the, the savior who was humiliated and ascended, in whose pattern we are invited to follow. Now, the words of Paul are inspired by the Holy Spirit and present to us a portrait of God, Christ, the Spirit, and the church. Now, as we gaze into this portrait, I don't know about you, but I've been to a few muse museums and you encounter a painting that arrests your view and gaze and you linger for a while. You absorb it for a while because as you look at the painting, you realize it's doing something to you. These words in Philippians invite us to do the same, to view them, to linger and to be arrested by them. We are invited to hear what the Spirit is saying to us today. We are also invited to respond accordingly. Very easy to listen to a sermon and enjoy the rhetoric, the rhythm, the cadence, and even the rhyme. And out of it all, get nothing that motivates us towards obedience and life. 
beyond the cadence, beyond the rhetoric. Let's hear what the Spirit is saying to the church and to us individually. Now, today's focus is on Paul's letter to Philippians, as I've said, a letter written by Paul from a Roman prison. Now, to understand the context of this letter, we need to go to the end of Acts 28. At Acts 28, we re read that Paul is now in Rome and is receiving a few people uh, in his place of confinement, Acts 28, 17 to 19. And it is believed that this letter is written uh, during this time. Now, Paul had been to uh, Philippi, and there he had met a few individuals, people like Lydia, who got saved, people like the Philippian jailer, this is Acts 16, who gets saved. Uh, we also hear about how the church itself functions in an imperial context. Notice there the church functions outside the gates of the city. They go out to meet, which suggests that there is some conflict between the imperial worship and the worship of Yahweh. Now, to understand Philippi, we need to go back in time, as the DJ said, way back, back into time. And I will try and sketch a brief history of Philippi. Philippi was taken over by a guy called Philip uh, the second, I think, around 323, around there somewhere. And this guy created what is then known as Philippi today. In this colony, uh, the colony was proximate to Rome, and later on, around 168, the Romans came in, coming from what is now known as Italy, settled there, and established a very strong base. Now, Philippi exists between Greece and the rest of the ancient Near East. So the route between Rome, Greece, and the ancient Near East was very much lucrative for trade and other things. So this was a strategic location. And at that city, there was what is called emperor worship. So the emperors loved themselves, your Caesars. So they would be venerated to the point of being exalted to godlike status. Augustus, Claudius, all of them. They had this emperor cult that people would follow after. And Philippi was a huge center for emperor worship. Imagine you are a Christian living in the face of emperor worship, where people are being told to worship Caesar or else. Paul writes in a context that is brimming with emperor worship, where Yahweh and the knowledge of God is not celebrated but frowned upon, even to the point of being persecuted. So we need to have this background as we read today's passage, which is Philippians 1, verse 1 to 11. I'll be reading from the ESV, uh, and so do follow the words uh, behind me. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and deacons, I thank or grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine for you all making my prayer with joy. Verse 5, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Verse 7, it is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the, de in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. Verse 8, for God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. Verse 10, so that you may approve what is excellent, so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. All theology is doxological. 
If you do theology right, you should find yourself lifting up your hands in praise and adoration. Because when you know who God is, the natural reaction is to praise the God you've come to encounter. And here we see Paul precipitating in this doxological phrase to the glory and praise of God. Now, I'll cover today's sermon under five headings, so I may move a bit rapid. The first one is the foundation of the Philippians. The second one is the faithfulness of the Philippians, and right at the heart of it, the faithfulness of God. The fourth one, the fondness of the Philippians, or for the Philippians, if you want, and the fruitfulness of the Philippians will be the last heading. So let's look at verse 1 and 2 together under the foundation of the Philippians. Paul writes, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but nobody walks around and say, hey, I am so and so servant. In this day and age, we don't walk around giving ourselves titles that are less than, but rather we like to project ourselves CEO, COO, CFO. Somehow we want to present ourselves based upon achievement or aspiration. Yet Paul does not work that way. His presentation is not, hey, hey, Paul, apostle to the Gentiles. Or student under Gamaliel. Hebrew of Hebrews. He says about something about that later on. He says it's all dung. But rather Paul begins and says, Paul and Timothy, servants. Now, if you're rushing, you might miss that. Because that word servant there actually is not the word servant, servant, as you hear it in the ESV. It's the word slave. I will say it again. It's the word slave. Paul and Timothy, slaves of Jesus Christ. Boom, mic drop, stop. Paul presents himself as the lowest common denominator in the Roman Empire. He presents himself as one with no rights. He presents himself as a slave. And this is primary identity. He is a slave of someone, a slave of Jesus Christ. Now, if you're black in here, you might be saying, ha ha, the slavery. No, I'm not a slave. I'm a child. I'm a child of God. I am a son of God. I'm a daughter of God. No slavery. Slavery for you, not for me. Friends, we might miss the point here because Paul is not using slavery as we now know slavery to be. But in the ancient world, everything happened because there were slaves. You wanted your bath warmed up, there is a slave for that. You wanted your electricity on, there is a slave for that. You wanted to shop online or on that version of online, there is a slave for that. Yeah. (laughs) Slavery was the pervasive across the Roman Empire. And slaves were the engine room of the Roman Empire. People who were conquered became slaves. People who were born into into slavery became slaves. Individuals who wanted to escape debt and pay off their debt became slaves. So slavery was not something that was uncommon. It was common but unenviable. Why? Because slaves did not have rights. Slaves belonged to another Slaves were controlled by another, and they could only get their freedom by paying for their freedom or by being given their freedom by the master. So Paul says, I don't present myself to you as apostle, Philippians, but I present myself to you as slaves, a slave of Jesus Christ. And this should cause us to pause. And I would ask this question to you and I today. How much of your identity is based upon what you have achieved? How much of our identity is formulated, based, uh, formulated around what we are aspiring for? If that is the central cog in our identity, may I suggest that there's something wrong with our understanding of the gospel? The gospel begins with the pronouncement of death, the death of the Messiah and the death of the follower. Christ Jesus has died. So has the follower of Jesus Christ. You have died to something. And so there is this embracing of death, this denigration of self before the master. 
Maybe some of us in here are carrying bucket loads of pride and we're very good at watering the garden of pride and we've got poisonous mushrooms that we are watering and we think we are actually doing well based upon our presentation of self. And we eat those mushrooms and we think, oh, I'll be very, oh, this will be nutritious. No. Yet we are killing ourselves because we present ourselves not in gospel framework, but in framework born of selfishness and pride. Who are you? Who are you? The answer should be a slave of Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about 17th century, 18th century transatlantic slave trade. I'm talking about first century Greco-Roman slavery. Who are you? What's the foundation of your identity? Slave. And it's hard to embrace slavery because it wars against everything about ambition in us. When you're ambitious and ambition and self-denigration war against each other. Who are you? Friends, notice he says, slaves of Christ Jesus, which means Christ Jesus is the Kyrios, the master. Paulus Ketimotheos, the duly of this Christ Jesus. Now, you might say, ha, Jesus is a master. Hi, man. I was taught that I'm a child of God. Now you're telling me I'm a slave of God. How does that work? Friends, there are many masters out there. There are masters that enslave and suck out the life out of us. That masters that exploit and abuse. Masters that cause us to be less than human and leave us less than human when we are in their service. Yet Jesus is the good master. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. This master gives life. He gives rights and identity and he leaves us in a better place than any other master you may find. My question then becomes, what master are you following after? If it is not Jesus Christ, that thing will leave you dead. That thing will leave you imprisoned. That thing will leave you less than human. Who is your master? Some are worshipping money, thinking that it's going to rain. <laughs> Thank you. My preacher here says you can't save God and mammon. <laughs> Hallelujah. Some in here are worshipping. Are worshipping at the foot of something that is sucking the life out of them. You think you're alive, but you're actually a walking corpse. Because you're worshipping the wrong master. If you're in that category, the gospel is saying loud and clear, there is a better master. This master loves you, and this master is calling you to live truly. So the way we view ourselves is founded on the masters we follow. The way we view ourselves is founded on the masters we follow. Who is your master? Christian. Are you saying Jesus is Lord and then finding yourself worshipping another master on the side? Syncretism. Can't work. Can't work. Non-Christian, may these words bring you to life. May they awaken you to the true master who brings life. Or may I flip it this way. Where do you throw your money at? If you want to know who your master is, just look at your budget and your bank statements. Where your money goes is where your master is. Some are worshipping the cult of image, waking up early in the morning and doing crossfit until their muscles bulge to the point of exploding. <laughs> and that cult of image basically saying, look at my six pack. And that's all that matters. It's not bad to work out. Work out, but let it not be your master. Some are worshipping at the foot, at the foot of greed. And corruption has come into the phase of thinking and they're affecting all that they do. And they're saying, oh, Jesus is Lord. Yet at the same time, the heart is hungry for that which poisons the soul. 
Which master are you worshipping? Paul continues to all the saints in Christ Jesus who were at Philippi. Notice, I'm going to move very quickly here. To all the saints in Christ Jesus. Friend, the definition of a Christian is locative. You have an address. And your address is in Christ, in Christo, in Christ Jesus. So your primary identity is not, oh, I am Afrikaans, or I am Kosa, or I am Zulu, or I am Shona. No, your primary identity is, I am a Christian. Because where are you found? In Christ. Everything else is secondary if you're a Christian. The primary identity marker of a Christian is locative, and it is found in Christ. And this Christ is a king. So you're in the kingdom of the Christ. You are a servant, a slave of this Christ. So to all the saints in Christ, I know there is Afrocentrism right now, and it's important to correct historical injustices. But let's be careful not to go too far with this thing where somehow my Africanness is more important than my Christianness. Where somehow my Afrikaansness is more important than my Christianness. The tent I wear is African. But the engine that drives this body is Christian. If we miss that, we relativize Christian identity and suck the power out of what God has done in Christ Jesus. Who are you in Christ? Where are you in Christ? And notice what Paul says, who are at Philippi? In Christ at Pretoria. With the overseers and deacons, I could go on here, episcopi and diaconi, uh, overseers and deacons. Now, church life has become, oh, hierarchy is right at the top, the men of God, the men of power for the hour. And this man of power for the hour has the word that comes with fire and causes you to shudder. And amens and hallelujahs and handkerchiefs are thrown all around. Bishop, apostle, apostle. And said with a bit of a, you know, there's, there's movement. Oh, like a Hallelujah. I'm like, they're sweating. You know, you know what I'm talking about. I'm like, he's got a big chair. Big chair up front. He's got a big car. He's got bodyguards. And when he's happy, he makes you drink petrol. Power, hour point Paul makes here is overseers and deacons. You can't think of overseers and deacons without thinking of slaves. Paul is saying, I am the one who appointed these guys, overseers and deacons. I am a slave, which means they are slaves too. A pastor, and a church leader, any leader has got to adopt the spirit of a slave for us to be gospel consistent. For us to live in step with the gospel, one of the things we need to do is to know that I am nothing. I am a slave. It's only in the emptying that we are actually filled up to serve. Only in the emptying that we are filled up to serve. And he says, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that term grace is harain, which is a Greek term for high, but Paul takes it and he Christianizes it and he points it back to charis. What we have received, we have not earned. Who we are, we have not earned. We have received it all by grace. And he says, grace to you and peace. Grace to you and peace from God. <laughs> the peace is shalom. So Paul is saying the Philippians are living in the redemptive continuity with what God did with Israel. You see the Philippians, God started it a long time ago. You see Rooted, God started it a long time ago. We are in thematic continuity with God's rescue for this town. You are not just a Christian. 
There is a history behind you. It looks like Abraham. It looks like David. It looks like Solomon. It looks like Gideon. It looks like Deborah. It looks like Lydia. It looks like Dorcas. Why? Because God's peace has been coming to those who are lost generation after generation. Grace and peace to you from God our Father. And you're a part of it. And the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh, friends, this Lord is better than Caesar. Caesar styled himself as Lord. And he styled himself as the father of the empire. And Paul is saying, forget Caesar. Don't identify with Caesar's patria patestas, meaning I am the father of the empire. But this Jesus and this father I'm talking about, greater than Caesar. So Paul is saying the kingdom is different that they are part of. So friends, my question then is, where is your allegiance? Where is your allegiance? I labor this point because it's an important foundational point. Where is your allegiance? Who are you serving? Let's go to the second point. The faithfulness of the Philippians. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer with, you, with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Now, these words sound similar to another Pauline letter called Philemon. He says the exact same thing. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Have you ever remembered somebody you haven't seen in a while and started smiling? Like, I love your sense of humor. Mm. Paul is in prison and he's got so much time on his hands and he thinks of the Philippians and what does he do? He prays for them. Have you ever thought of somebody instead of praying for them? Say, Lord, please bless that person wherever they are. They helped me so much. Tell you a story. One time we lost our house in the UK. We were homeless. Long story. This Nigerian man came to me. He took me by the hand and he gave me a hundred pounds to hop on a train to go to my mentor who had prophesied over me and said, listen, I see a time of trouble coming in your life. When that happens, you have a home here, come here. Those words came back to me. I did not have money to go to where my mentor was. This Nigerian man gave me a hundred pounds to get on a train to Norwich. I don't know his name, never seen him again. But every time I remember him, Lord bless that man and his family. Have you ever been rescued by somebody you've never met before? Somebody you've never known before? And when you think about them, you're like, oh Lord, wherever they are, bless them. Paul is remembering the Philippians, a church that has supported him through trial. And whenever he remembers them, he prays for them. Maybe our remembrance of people we love, like, and those who have helped us should go beyond just saying, oh, he's a lovely guy, she's a lovely girl. Rather, it should spill over to, Lord, please, I'm praying for that individual. Bless them wherever they are. Maybe our remembrance should be partnered with a lifestyle of praying for the people we remember. As we read Paul's words, we see him doing that. But he just doesn't pray. It's not mechanical. It's not lethargic. It is filled with joy. <laughs> He's in prison, remember? How can you be so joyful, praying joyfully in prison? Because of the gospel. Because of their partnership in the gospel. And that word partnership is the word kinonos. It's the word kinonia. It's the word kinonia, which points, don't say koinonia, it's kinonia. Uh, the word kinonia, which basically means this partnership, this Togetherness, this sharing and participating in something that is broader than an individual. Friends, your resources are not your own. Somebody has laid claim to them. Your house, ah, it might be in a nicer, but it's not yours. The clothes on your back are not yours. Somebody has laid claim to them because you are a slave. A slave does not have rights except the rights of the master. So if we have a possessive mentality, the gospel challenges that and says, God can lay claim to anything and redirect it anywhere because we are his slaves. And here, the Philippians had resources that they were giving to Paul 
because they were in partnership with Paul in the gospel. My question then becomes, uh, are we those who are participating in the gospel broader than our individual selves? You know, you can have a consumerist Christian experience where it's about coming to Rooted, having great coffee, saying the right words, singing great songs, thank you, by the way, and not having a global vision of what God is doing. God has sent you somebody who lives in France today. God is at work there as well. And it takes finance. Yes, I said it. It takes finance for the work of God to be done. So if you are stingy, the gospel actually is inhibited by you. That's why generosity is a hallmark of the people of God. Because we are interested in that which is broader than our own location goes beyond and is more important than our own aspirations. The Philippians partnered with Paul and they continued to partner with Paul. The question to us today is who are you partnering with in the gospel? Who is receiving your financial blessing for them to continue serving God? There was a lady when I was in Somerset West, I was a student and I was perpetually broke. This lady used to give me 500 rand every month. Every month. Came in an envelope. I used to go to an AOG church and some of the ladies there, old pensioners, Pentecostal type, speaking with an Afro-Caribbean accent. Oh, me love you, me brother. Me love you. Oh, Jesus is Lord, me brother. Here, here, come here, come here. Me love you, me love you. She would then land a kiss on my cheek and then... Oh, there he goes. <laughs> Lend a kiss on my cheek and then put something in my hand. And that was 20 pounds, 30 pounds. Generosity of people you have not known has given me you as a servant today. When you are generous, you're contributing to a broader vision of a gospel beyond your own location. Rushing to the third point, uh, the faithfulness of God. And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Notice Paul's words, I am sure of this. Now, what is a good work? He will begin a good work. Now, the good work here is not all anything you're dreaming about, anything you're aspiring for. The good work is you and I becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. That's the good work. Everything else will fall away. The good work is us resembling Christ. At the end of the days, God is going to put Christ here and you in the next category. And there's going to be a comparison. How much like Jesus do you look and be rewarded accordingly? So Paul is praying that the Philippians become more like Jesus because this is the ultimate goal. My question then becomes, what do you wake up in the morning for? Yes, we got to work. Yes, we got to eat. Yes, we got to pay bills. But there's something greater. And that greater thing is to resemble Christ. And Paul is praying that this resembling of Christ, what theologians have called experiential sanctification, this growth in Christ-likeness is consistent and progressive in the Philippians' journey. My question do you want to become like Christ? Are you pursuing Christ likeness? Friends, we cannot become like Christ if we don't live with the end in mind. It's fundamentally important that we have a vision of the end today because it's the end that influences our present behavior. If we don't have a vision that Christ is coming back, then how I live today does not matter. If we have a vision that Christ is coming back, then we align our behavior. We control ourselves via the help of the Spirit, and we are propagated towards faithful living today. Perhaps we need to enlarge our vision of the end. Have a broader vision of that Jesus Christ is coming back. And is coming back to judge the living and the dead. Point four, the fondness 
for the Philippians. Reading from verse 7. And it is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of a gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. Notice Paul says they are partakers of grace with him. In other words, Paul is not saying I am more important than you, but it's the same grace that Paul received that which the Philippians received. Friends, the different functions in Christianity do not give us levels of importance. We function differently, but we are all equal. We function differently, but we are all equal. And Paul is saying, yes, I am the apostle who helped you understand the gospel, but listen, we are partakers together in this grace. And they are also partners in in pain and in plenty. Have you ever stood alongside somebody who has got or is challenged by so much difficulty? Sharing in their suffering. Walking that journey with them. Feeling that pain as if it is your own. The Philippians were doing that with Paul who is in prison. And notice, prison was not like today's prison where you're given a meal, some clothes, a bed. No, no, no. Everything you needed needed to be supplied from externally. So the food you needed, the toothbrush you needed, the clothes you needed. That's why Paul says to Timothy, don't forget my scrolls. Because all that Paul needed came from the churches that he had planted and supported. So the partnership went beyond just material things. It was both about plenty and pain, suffering together even as Paul was in prison. My question then becomes, do you suffer well? Sometimes we have an attitude to suffering that is, oh, I'm going to pray until it goes away and it doesn't go away. And sometimes we say, oh, I'm going to ignore it until it goes away and then it doesn't go away. Sometimes we're in a situation where we ask ourselves, why did you do this to me? I must not be suffering, and it's still there. Friends, what Paul teaches us is that we should suffer well, to suffer with a posture of the heart infused by the gospel. When our heart is infused by the gospel, the way we suffer is also concerned about those who see us suffering. You see, suffering is an apologetic When we suffer well, people read us and they learn how to suffer well. And Paul is suffering right here. He's not throwing his toys out of a prim. I'm like, Jesus, I don't like this. Jesus, man, Jesus, Jesus, man, Jesus. No. But the language of Paul is a language of confidence in the gospel. How many of us are like, Jesus, man, Jesus, Jesus, man, Jesus. Why, 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 why? Let's hear the words of Paul. The words that stand firm even in persecution and in pain. And imbibe these words. Because as we suffer well, we are teaching others how to suffer in a gospel paradigm. Paul loves the Philippians. He's very fond of them. But he's also teaching them how to suffer well. We have a gospel these days that does not present suffering as the pathway of a Christian. We have a gospel that tells us that materialism is the ultimate goal, that comfort is the goal. That is far from a gospel. In fact, it's not gospel at all. If Jesus suffered, his followers are going to suffer. You may even die. And suffering for the gospel is a marker of true faith. So when you suffer, don't complain, but praise God to be counted worthy to suffer. We do not celebrate suffering, but we hold the right posture when we suffer. Moving on to my last point, the fruitfulness of a Philippians. In case you were wondering, that alarm clock rang 10 minutes before time. So just to let you know. Verse 9, and it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. Ah, let me pause here. Many of us have a view of love that is sentimental, emotional, and very much fuzzy. 
We sing songs like, I love, I love, I love your presence. Uh, we sing, Lord, sometimes we actually make Jesus sound like our girlfriend. Because the love that we are singing about at times is not cross-shaped, but it is emotionally motivated. Want to know what love looks like? Look at a man crucified. That's what love looks like. Substitutionary death of Jesus Christ, where he takes on the death of a criminal and is nailed to the cross as a criminal and he dies the death of a sinner. That's love. So next time you're saying, oh, I love, I love, I love, and it's all emotional butterflies, expunge that image from your eyes, uh, from your ears, oh, no, ears, mind. Uh, that's the word I was looking for. Expunge that image from your mind uh, and have the crucified Savior in his place. That's love. For God so loved the world that he gave. It's not just, okay, there you can have him. No, to death. Perhaps we have been corrupted by an image of love where it's all emotion, sentimentalism, and enjoyment, and all things going well. Friends, love demonstrated by God is sacrificial. You can't say you love somebody if you don't sacrifice for them. You can't say you love a church if you don't lay your, down your time for the church. You can't say you love rooted and you don't give to rooted. You can't say you love the work of God at rooted and you're not even participating in any ministry at rooted. You can't say you love coming to rooted and all you love is a coffee and you don't stand up on a Sunday morning to help with the setup of a church. You can't say you love these people over here and you're not invested in the person over here. God so loved us that God became human walked among us, lived among us, lived the life that we should have lived, but could not. Yet died the death that we deserved, and we did not. So Paul tells us that he has this love for the Philippians, and he also tells us that he wants their love to grow. But how does love grow? You see, if you don't feed love with the word of God, what turns out happening is that it becomes sentimental mushiness. To grow in knowledge. Friends, your mind is not your enemy. Think. Many have come to church and said, oh, I just want an emotional, spiritual experience, and I'm just going to put my mind at the door and then pick it up as I leave. The reality of a gospel is that our whole selves are engaged. My mind, my heart, my body, everything about the individual is engaged in the gospel. So this dichotomizing, saying, oh, the heart is, oh, all I want is about the heart, not the mind. That's not gospel. I'm like, oh, this is more important. We want this, not this. No, you want this and this. The two are not working against each other. They complement. So let us grow in the knowledge of who Christ is. And as we do, we find our hearts ablaze with Christ. A true theologian, a true Bible reader, a true Bible preacher, a true Christ follower loves with a heart and mind. Hear ye, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love your God with all your heart. Yet we are emotional. We turn the worship service into an emotional escapade where the mind is not engaged. Grow in your knowledge of Christ. How do you do it? Through the scriptures. Grow in your understanding of who Christ is. How do we do it? Through the scriptures. And you will find as you do, you start growing in discernment. Uh, that's not quite right. You don't single out people and say, ha, 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 friend, that was wrong. Point number one, point number two. No, 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 don't do that. That's not quite right. No, I'm not going to go there. Discernment starts to grow in you. Not only discernment of others, but discernment of your own behaviors. Yeah. Uh, I'm not quite sure about that move. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to do that. The check of the spirit in your hearts becomes louder and louder. 
Before you even fall into sin, you are afraid of sinning. You are repenting before you even fall into sin because the thought just crossed your mind. Why are you growing in love? So that you may approve what is excellent. And so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Friends, if you don't grow in love and in discernment, what ends up happening is that we are unprepared for the final day. Friends, for us to be fruitful, for us to be fruitful and to have the fruit of righteousness, love needs to grow. And Paul prays for this, for the Philippians. Perhaps many of us in here have set many different exams. All those exams are important in one way or the other. But there's one exam that matters beyond any other exam. The exam that will re render you well done, good and faithful servant. Or, I'm not pleased with you. My question then to us is this, are we living with the end in mind and are we growing in our fruitfulness in love? If we are not, the invitation of Paul through this prayer is that we would awaken to thanksgiving, awaken to this rhythm of five elements, the fruitfulness that the Philippians were encouraged to grow in, the fondness that the Philippians had for Paul and for us to have that fondness for others, the faithfulness of God to making sure that we become more like Christ on a daily basis, the faithfulness of the Philippians in supporting Paul and also a clear foundation that we are not masters, but we are slaves. Friends, I want to pause here. I've taken a while to expound this passage, but it will be pointless for me just to end here without inviting us to respond well. So I'm going to invite the band to come up and help us with the musical background, consider it a canvas on which God can paint what he needs to paint in our hearts. And I will invite us to stand, if you may. Perhaps you're in this room and your identity is locked up on achievement and uh, your works define who you are. Your achievements define who you are. You love being called teacher, rabbi, or even doctor, or whatever. More than you love being called a slave for Jesus Christ. Perhaps you're in this room and you don't even know who Jesus is. May I tell you one important truth. Jesus loves you. He loves you so much that he has made a plan for you to have eternal life. And eternal life is the best gift imaginable. The gift the God, the, a gift that God gives to all those who would believe in Jesus Christ. Those who would confess their sin and repent of their sin are given the opportunity to live the best life imaginable. And this life is only possible through faith, believing Jesus, renouncing sin and following after Jesus. You see, you cannot live this life alone. You cannot even attempt to have the best life alone because every attempt leads to a dead end, a frustrating end, and even a destructive end. Yet there is life in Christ. And Christ has called you, Christ has called me to respond to this invitation where this gift is presented to you and I. All it takes is to believe that Jesus Christ died in your stead for your sin for all those messes, for all those things you have not told anyone about, those things you carry in your heart that are corrupting and are disgusting. He died for that. He died to rescue you and me, to make us more like him. But you cannot begin the journey without acknowledging that you need him, without acknowledging that you need rescue, without acknowledging that, listen, you're messed up and you need the help of a savior. So I'm going to invite us to close our eyes now. As we have heard from Paul, there are many in this room who are asking, how can I, how can I walk with God faithfully? How can I 
come alive? How can I be born again? How can I begin this journey? If you are in that category, I'll invite you just to indicate by raising your hand. I see a hand. I see another. I see a hand. I see another. I see another. I see another. Thank you for your courage to raise your hands. And I want to pray with you now where you are. You don't need to come up front. And I want you to say these words with me. Lord Jesus, I confess that I am a sinner. I need you. My life is a mess. And I need you to rescue me. I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you died for my sin. I believe that you rose from the dead. And I believe that you love me. Rescue me from my sin as you promised. And help me to follow after you. From this day onwards, I ask. Now, if you pray that prayer, if you lifted up your hand, this church has got a great team of people, people who want to walk a journey with you, people who are invested in your well-being. I would invite you to come to the front and meet some of the leaders who will help you understand what you just prayed and the implications of what you just prayed. Now, in this room, we also have Christians, people who have been walking with Jesus for a while. Yet somehow your walk has become a bit lethargic. You're a bit heavy in the legs and you cannot take the next step with freedom. People who have been walking with Jesus for a while and have become a bit jaded. You don't love Jesus the same way you loved him. Maybe you've gone through persecution, difficulty, and your view of Christ has changed. Perhaps you want a revitalization to be reawakened. If you are in that category, may I invite you again with every eye closed, just lift up your hand and indicate that you would like this from the Savior. Thank you, Lord. Oh. See, so many hands. Don't be shy. Jesus is a giver of good gifts. pray for my brothers and sisters I pray for our hearts that are weary for our he legs that are heavy laden we ask oh God that you would grant us grace we know of no other who gives the gift of life we know of no other well where we can drink and be satisfied except you Lord Jesus so for my brothers and sisters today, I ask, oh Lord, that you would revive us again. Awaken us by your spirit to enjoy your word. Awaken us by your spirit to enjoy your truth. Awaken us by your spirit, oh God, to believe again where we have been jaded and affected by life's many trials. Lord, for those who are in pain because of what somebody else has done to them, I pray, Lord, that you would heal their pain, that you would help them to walk with you with the confidence that you are a God who is present and a very present helper in the time of need. For those, of oh God, who have stopped believing, are shaky in their faith, won't you come to them like a mighty, mighty rushing wind and blow away that which needs to be cast out and establish your throne in their hearts again, O oh God. For those, oh God, who are so ambivalent about tomorrow, yet not knowing what to do about tomorrow, I ask, oh Lord, that you be the voice of clarity, speaking clearly to their hearts and even shining your light and your truth to them. Oh Lord, we need you. We need you every hour we need you. We cannot walk this life without you. 
you are the giver of good gifts you are the sustainer of us of our lives oh god and we know we need you so give us yourself lord we need you jesus we need you lord won't you speak to our hearts speak to our souls nourishing us a love for Jesus. Won't you speak to our hearts? Won't you speak to our souls? Nourishing us. A love for the Savior. Lord, we repent for loving other masters, for pursuing other gods. We come to you the true and living God. And we ask that we may bow at your feet and live our lives in view of your wonderful mercy. We ask that we will lay aside everything that so easily, easily entangles and that we'll focus our eyes on the author and finisher of our faith, Jesus Christ, the Lord. Awaken our hearts to the beauty of a savior. Awaken our hearts to the beauty of thanksgiving and prayer. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.